All right, good morning. My name is Reed. I'm one of the pastors here, and it is truly my joy to be with you all this morning as we uh, get ready to open God's Word. I'm going to go ahead and dismiss the kids. They can stand up and head out this front door with their teachers. And I know that as, as you were listening to the, the stories of Lottie Moon, that uh, there were a lot of parents out there that heard the story of the bell tower and thought, well, maybe there's hope for my, my child, right? <laughs> uh, no, I'm, I'm thankful and, and very excited to be able to, this month, focus on what God is doing around the world, to hear stories of faithful men and women who have given their lives to share God's truth with those who have never heard. But this month isn't just about reminding us of who we support and who we're partnered with around the world. It's reminding us of our own responsibility to be missionaries, to follow God's call and His command right here where we're at. And so that's been uh, our, one, one of our primary focuses as we've been continuing our study through the book of, of Acts. Uh, and so we are going to be picking up, if you want to go ahead and turn there, we'll get there in just a moment. We're going to be uh, finishing up chapter 21 and going through most of chapter 22. So uh, I know you think, that's a lot. He's going to go through all of that. We will, all right? We'll make it, we'll make it through. And I'm even going to start my timer here just so we, we're, we're careful about that. Well, I, I always look forward to the holidays, and, and one thing that comes along with that is, is people coming and, and visiting church. Maybe they're visiting family here for the first time. But you get to see family that you haven't seen in a long time. You get to see friends. And, and one thing is that we're all c- kind of can relate to is, is that idea of developing friendships. Whether it's in, in the job that you're in or maybe you move to a new place. I remember, you know, Heather and I have lived in a lot of different places. And as you move to a new place, one of the first things you do is you try to develop relationships with people around you, right? You try to get to know people, to, to make friends. And, and especially in ministry, as, as you're, you're going through and you're trying to connect with people, we, we try to build bridges and to, to connect with people in order to develop relationships. And I'll never forget one time, this was shortly after Heather and I were, were married, uh, that we worked with actually the, the church that Stephen and Gina uh, were also in. We worked with some of the college kids. We hosted the college group at our house and so these kids would come from the university, and I thought, here I am. I was maybe uh, in, in my mid-20s at the time, not too far removed from where they were. And I thought, you know, I can connect with, with these people. And so I was driving one, uh, one day with one of the guys, um, and it was about a 30-minute drive. So I thought, I can really use this time. I'm going to develop some connections. We're going to talk about how God's working in his life. But it always starts with c- making those connections. So I started with, you know, things I like. I said, well, well, do you like camping or, or anything like that? Being outside, hiking, backpacking? And he starts out by saying, oh, no, I can't even imagine sleeping outside in a tent. I thought, okay, well, there goes that one. That's like half of the, the things I enjoy. So, but, but that's not the end. We can find some more things. So I started going through this list and just trying to find some way to connect so I could start building that bridge to, to impact his life. And, and I, I don't think we ever, the whole 30 minute ride found something. I've since gotten better at doing that. Uh, but that happens a lot of times. Uh, I, I, another situation, I go to the, a gym in, in town, and primarily so that, I mean, one, so that I can keep up with my kids, but two, so I can develop relationships with people in the community. And I, I always, every once in a while, show up at the gym with a, a shirt on that says either Green Bay Packers or Milwaukee Bucks or uh, Wisconsin Badgers, not because I'm diehard, a diehard fan of those teams, but because I'm married to a family that is, I don't even know if you can call them diehard, that might not be enough. Uh, and so they, for every Christmas and birthday, they'll send me these nice shirts that, that have these teams on them. And so I, I think, oh, I'll wear these because it's a nice shirt. I go to the gym, and almost every time people see that, and they, oh, hey, did you see that last game? Did this person, did, and how, what do you feel about this? 
And I, I joke with Stephen because I've gotten pretty good at just pretending like I know what I'm talking about. And my greatest fear is that they're going to figure out one day that I don't really watch uh, Wisconsin sports enough to be able to have a, a conversation about it. So I've faked my way enough. But it's that idea of I, I want to be able to have something to c- connect with people. And we do this all the time in our lives. We try to build these bridges. You, may, you might do it in your, your work. If you're in anything that does sales, you do this often. What is a, a salesman's greatest responsibility? It's to try to get that person to, to believe that they need it, and you develop con- connections with them. And you, you tell them a story. You say, hey, I'm the same way. You develop this relationship, and that's a little bit different because you're doing it with the, the goal to have them buy something. Uh, but, but we do this a lot in life. We, we build bridges, we make connections by finding something in common so that we can accomplish a goal. Whether that's friendship, trying to sell them something, or more importantly, and what we're going to focus on this morning, is to share the truth of the gospel. When it comes to sharing the truth of the gospel, we should strive to do this very same thing. To build bridges, to make connections, to de- develop relationships. You see, we have been commissioned to take the gospel to those who don't know about Jesus. That doesn't just mean in faraway places around the world. That means right here in our own community, our, our family, our friends, our neighbors, our coworkers. And we should be looking for opportunities to build these relationships to, for the gospel, to make connections for the purpose of sharing the good news of Jesus. You see, many people are really good at making the connection, to, to, to building that relationship. I, I, it's a skill to be able to go and, and find something in common between you and someone else and really focus on that to develop a bond. And, and some of us, many of us, are really good at doing that. But we often fail to use that connection to then share what Jesus has done in our own lives. And so I want to focus on that this morning as we look at our passage. Just to do a quick recap, if you weren't with us last week, we, we're, we're following the journey of Paul. And remember, Paul was, was wrapping up his third missionary journey, and he is on his way, headed to Jerusalem. And, and all along the way, he stops, and, and it, it says that the Holy Spirit confirmed that this is where he should go, but that when he gets there, there's going to be persecution and trials and, and, and along the way, that's just been confirmed again and again. And so those that care about Paul, when they hear this, they think, Paul, God has given you a clear sign not to go there. You're going to face persecution. They're, they're going to remember that prophet that came and bound his hands and feet and said that this is going to happen to Paul if he goes to Jerusalem. So, so obviously you can't go, but Paul knew this was God's plan for his life, and he, and he went with joy. And so we've been tracing this, this journey of Paul, he was convicted uh, and convinced that this was God's plan for his life. And so as he, he, he gets to Jerusalem, which we'll pick up here, just him arriving into Jerusalem and the events that unfold, we are going to focus on this main idea in application to us. In order to fulfill our mission, we must seek to build bridges for the gospel by developing intentional relationships so we can share the story of God's transformational work in our lives through the power of the gospel. This is what we should seek to do. This is what we see Paul doing. This is what we see all the missionaries that we've been talking about this month and reading about. This is what they're doing, and this is what we should be doing as Christians pursuing our mission. The first way that we do this, the first way that we begin to build these bridges is we have to begin by removing and be, being willing to remove all obstacles that stand in our way. And so we have a, a lot of passage to get through here today, so I encourage you, um, if you don't already have your Bible open, uh, if you need a Bible, there's one right under the seat in front of you, that black one there. If you don't have a Bible at home, please take that. Uh, that's our gift to you. And so we're going to break this up. We'll read a section and talk about it and then, and then go back to God's word. But we're going to begin by looking at Acts chapter 21, beginning in verse 15, right where we left off last week. So Acts 21, 15, we're going to read uh, through verse 26. After this, we got ready. 
and went up to Jerusalem. Some of the disciples from Caesarea also went with us and brought us to Nasons of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we were to stay. When we reached Jerusalem, the brothers and sisters welcomed us warmly. The following day, Paul went in with us to James. Now remember, James is, this is not the disciple James, this is James, the brother of, half-brother of Jesus, who is the, the primary elder and pastor of the church there in Jerusalem. And all the elders were present. After greeting them, he reported in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. When they heard it, they glorified God and said, You see, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are, uh, there are who have believed, and they are all zealous for the law. But they have been informed about you, that you are teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to abandon Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or to live according to our customs. So what is to be done? They will certainly hear that you've come. Therefore, do what we tell you. We have four men who have made a vow. Take these men, purify yourself along with them, and pay for them to get their heads shaved. Then everyone will know that what they were told about you amounts to nothing, but that you yourself are also careful about observing the law. With regard to the Gentiles who have believed, we have written a letter containing our decision that they should keep themselves from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from what is strangled, and from sexual immorality. So the next day, Paul took the men, having purified himself along with them, and entered the temple, announcing the completion of the purification days when the offering would be made for each of them. So here we have this. Paul finally gets to Jerusalem, and where does he go first? He goes right to the church. He goes to the church and begins to meet with the elders there. And instead of them running and saying, oh, we're so glad that you're here. Tell us why you're here, and we want to help you accomplish what you want to do. He, he came in and, and to the, a very strained political climate in Jerusalem. And so as we look at kind of where Jerusalem was at, we've, we've gotten a little bit of this history leading up to this. But I just want to do a quick uh, little picture of the political climate in Jerusalem. First of all, the governor at this time was Felix, who we'll, we'll meet a little bit later in, this, uh, in the next chapter. Um, and he was very oppressive towards the Jewish people. Many, he killed many innocent civilians. During this time, there were many uprisings uh, because of his strong, uh, heavy-handed leadership. There were many uprisings which he put down very swiftly and violently. And things actually got so bad that that the emperor at the time of Rome, who was Nero, decided to pull him out because it was too much. And so this was kind of who was ruling over Jerusalem at this time. And so this caused a great sense of nationalism, you can imagine, among the Jewish people. They, they said, this is who we are. We're being oppressed. We want to we keep who we are as, as God's chosen people. And much of this centered around not only what they believed, their religious beliefs and following the law, but also the, the physical building of the temple. And so they saw that, that building, the temple, as, as something that, that was, was their, their last kind of identity and following the law and that they were God's chosen people. So this is kind of, they were pushed into the sense of nationalism. And so any perceived attack on any of those things would not be met well in Jerusalem. And so this is kind of what we see. The, the elders are in this difficult position, uh, at a tough spot, because they supported Paul. James was supporting Paul in what he was doing, but they also knew that there's a lot of Jewish Christians who have been hearing all these things about Paul and have, have a, a bad view of who he is and what he is doing. So remember that collection of money. This is one of the reasons that Paul was coming back to Jerusalem. He was bringing... All of this money collected by the, the, the churches taken to Jerusalem to help bring unity. But you don't even see it mentioned here because they're stepping into this climate and, and it's almost impossible to see how this gift could restore the tension and, and prevent the tension from happening here in Jerusalem. So we can learn a lot from how Paul handled this. And so what does he do? First of all, we learn that we must be willing to go to great lengths to preserve unity. As we read the story here, what does Paul do? He comes in and he is told that 
he, th- there's great unrest. And that people have heard all of this stuff about him and that they're not going to accept what he says. And Paul knew that unity would advance the gospel, but disunity in the church would tear it apart. And they would have no platform to share the gospel. And so he is willing to, to remove any obstacle to that. And so he says, okay, what do they say about me? They, they say that I don't care about the law, I don't observe the law. Now, has Paul ever said that? He hasn't. He has told people, the, the Gentiles, that they don't need to follow some of those laws, but he has never told the, the Jewish people that you have to abandon all of those things. Moses isn't important. You don't need to do these things. And so what does he do? He goes in and he participates in this sacrifice. So we ask, why would he offer these sacrifices? Why would Paul go in and take part of this system that he says is no longer necessary? Well, he does it to preserve unity. He recognizes that going in and participating in this with these men, he looked at these sacrifices as a memorial to remember what Christ has done. He did not believe that they had any cleansing power over sin. You know, too many times we destroy the bridge before we even get to the truth of the gospel by making a big deal out of unimportant things, right? We're really good at that. If we're honest, especially Christians, we can take secondary issues that we have a strong opinion on and and want to make our stake in that, plant our flag in that. This is what we're going to die for, right? And Paul could have very easily said, well, no, the the sacrifices are not necessary, so I'm not going to do this, what the elders suggested. And he would have destroyed any opportunity that he had to bring unity. He says, look, this is not the primary thing. The primary thing is unity and sharing the gospel. So what do I need to do to remove these obstacles? There are many things in our lives today that we like to put above the gospel that are more important to us than the the, the saving power of Jesus Christ. And we make a big deal about those things. Whether it's the the type of music that we listen to or the dress that we wear or, or anything else that we like to focus on that prevents us from building those relationships and building those bridges that give us an opportunity to share God's truth with those around us. Paul knew what was most important. Secondly, we see that we must choose humility. In this passage, it's interesting that Paul submitted to the elders. Here's Paul, the Apostle Paul, and he submits to these elders who are asking him to do something that he was not obligated to do. But he saw the bigger picture. He could have easily said no, but he is doing it for the gospel. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 19 through 23, this is a letter written by Paul, where he explains probably his thinking even in this moment in Jerusalem. He says this, Although I am free from all and not anyone's slave, I have made myself a slave to everyone, humility, in order to win more people. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win Jews. To those under the law, like one under the law. Though I myself am not under the law, to win those under the law. To those who are without the law, like one without the law. Though I am not without God's law, but under the law of Christ. Why? To win those without the law. To the weak, I became weak in order to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that I might, by every possible means, save some. Now I do all this because of the gospel, so that I might share in the blessing. You see his mindset? He's saying there's so many things in this life that are of secondary importance to the gospel. Our mission is not to make people think just like we do. To have the same political views that we do or the same, all of the same thinking that we do. Our goal is to share with them what Jesus has done for them. And then God is the one who transforms their life. We get so stuck on all of these different things that we miss our primary purpose. Paul, first of all, was willing to remove all obstacles so that he could accomplish his task. And we should do the same. The passage goes on. I'm going to read in beginning in verse 27 through verse 39. It says, When the seven days were nearly over, so they're going into the temple and about to complete this sacrifice, Some Jews from the province of Asia saw him in the temple. 
stirred up the whole crowd and seized him, shouting, Fellow Israelites, help! This is a man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people, our law, and this place, the temple. What's more, he also brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they have previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, in the city with him, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. The whole city was stirred up, and the people rushed together. They seized Paul, dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut. As they were trying to kill him, word went up to the commander of the regiment that all Jerusalem was in chaos. Taking along soldiers and centurions, he immediately ran down to them. Seeing the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the commander approached, took him into custody, and ordered him to be bound with two chains. He asked who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd were shouting one thing and some another, since he was not able to to get reliable information because of the uproar, he ordered him to be taken into the barracks. When Paul got to the steps, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd. For the mass of people following, yelling, Get rid of him! As he was about to be brought into the barracks, Paul said to the commander, Am I allowed to say something to you? He replied, You know how to speak Greek? Aren't you the Egyptian who started a revolt some time ago and led 4,000 men of the assassins into the wilderness? Paul said, I am a Jewish man from Tarsus of Cilicia, a citizen of an important city. Now I ask you, let me speak to the people. And so here we have this kind of transition. And it's interesting, I have a picture up on the screen that you can look at just to get an idea of the temple. And I think I have... This was, was Daisy's idea here. I have a pointer that I can use. Can you see that? All right. So this is the temple. And so out, out here, the, this big area, and on this side too, is what's called the court of the Gentiles. And so anyone could go into this and, and, and worship, be a, a part of the temple, but they could not, if you were a, a Gentile, could not cross this, there's a short, probably waist-high wall right here that they could not cross. In here, you have a different court of the women, and then as you get closer into uh, where the Holy of Holies was, there, they, it was very restricted. And, and so as they, uh, they were going in here, this, this wall right here has inscription all along it that basically says, if you cross this and you are not Jewish, that you'll die. And interestingly enough, this was one of the things that the, the Romans allowed the, the Jews to continue to do carry out these executions of people who would violate this. And so it was a big deal, very important to them. And so as they see Paul in the temple, they, they get all worked up. And they try to stir up the people, these, these Jews that wanted nothing to do with him. And so they say, oh, he has brought Gentiles into the places they shouldn't be. And they had no real proof of this. They just supposed that it happened when in fact it didn't. But they didn't care. They just wanted to stir up anger against Paul so that they could kill him. And so as they, they begin this riot, they, they grab Paul, they take him out, they begin beating him, and word gets back to, you see this building up here? This is uh, called the Antonia Fortress, and it was built by Herod the Great, and it was there to house a, a regiment of soldiers to be able to, one, protect the temple, but probably more so to prevent any riots that, uh, that rose up in the temple. Because that's most likely where the Jews would begin if they tried to rise up against the Romans. So they had this, and it was literally up above looking down over the whole temple. And so this is where the Romans would have been. And so it helps us understand this story a little bit more. As they brought Paul out, they began beating him. There's all of this commotion. The commander of those forces from his position above sees what's going on, and, and all of the soldiers run down to stop what's happening. And it's, the, two, he, he grabs Paul, and they, they keep him from being killed, and then they ask him, they say, well, well who are you? And, and actually, he thinks that he's this Egyptian who was uh, a rebel that led this great uprising against the Romans, saying that he was the Messiah, and, and led this, this uh, group of 4,000 assassins. It sounds like a pretty interesting story, right? But they were basically terrorists. That would go in and he, they stood on the, the Mount of Olives and looked down and said, um, I'm going to just speak, all the walls will fall down. 
and we're going to rush in and, and uh, take over the city. And so Felix, the governor, quickly acted and, and squashed that rebellion, but this man ran into the desert. And so the commander here is thinking, I've got this guy. I've caught the one. This is going to be great for him, but soon he learns that this is not who Paul is. And so Paul begins by asking, let me speak to the people. And here's where we get to our second way to build bridges for the gospel. One, we need to be ready to tell our story. Be ready to tell your story. Let's continue in uh, chapter 21, verse 40. And this is going to be, I'm going to move quickly through it because it's a lot of recap from uh, diff- earlier in the book of Acts. So 21, verse 40. After he'd given permission, Paul stood on the steps and motioned with his hand to the people. When there was a great hush, he addressed them in Aramaic. Brothers and fathers, listen now to my defense before you. When they heard that he was addressing them in Aramaic, they became even quieter. He continued, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strictness of your ancestral law. I was zealous for God, just as as all of you are today. I persecuted this way, speaking of Christianity, to the death, arresting and putting both men and women in jail, as both the high priests and the whole council of elders can testify about me. After I received letters from them to the brothers, I traveled to Damascus to arrest those who were there and bring them to Jerusalem to be punished. As I was traveling and approaching Damascus, about noon an intense light from heaven suddenly flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, the one you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light, but they did not hear the voice of the one who was speaking to me. I said, What should I do, Lord? The Lord told me, Get up and go into Damascus, and there you will be told everything You have been uh, assigned to do. Since I couldn't see because of the brightness of the light, I was led by the hand of those who were with me and went to Damascus. Someone named Ananias, a devout man according to the law, who had a good reputation with all the Jews living there, came and stood by me and said, Brother Saul, regain your sight. And in that very hour, I looked up and saw him. And he said, The God of our ancestors has appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear the words from his mouth, since you will be a witness for him to all people of what you have seen and heard. And now, why are you delaying? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. After I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw him telling me, hurry and get out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony about me. But I said, Lord, they know that in the synagogue, After synagogue, I had those who believed in you imprisoned and beaten. And when the blood of your witness, Stephen, was being shed, I stood there giving approval and guarding the clothes of those who killed him. He said to me, Go, because I will send you far away to the Gentiles. And so here, Paul gets up, and it's a story that we've heard previously in Acts. We get a little more detail here, but it's his testimony of how God saved him. And it's very interesting that as he, he, he stands up, Paul has this incredible opportunity to address all of these people who were moments before just trying to kill him. And what does he do? Paul, Paul has had this opportunity many times before. He, he, he doesn't launch into a one-hour exposition of the sacrificial system or, or the, the books of the Old Testament or go into all this theological and doctrinal things. What does he do? He simply tells his story. So, as Christians, and what we learn from Paul, we see that we need to be ready to tell our story. The most compelling testimony of the gospel is sharing what God has done in your own life. Sharing what God has done in your own life. We need to be ready and willing to do that. God has transformed you. He's taken you from being dead in your trespasses and sins and made you alive in him. What an incredible thing he has done to transform us. And being able to tell others of what we have directly and personally experienced 
that transformational power will connect better than, than anything else. And so as we think about this, we need to, to understand that all Christians, all Christians should be ready with an apologetic message. Now what does that mean? It doesn't mean that you need to apologize, right? An apologetic message simply means a defense of why you believe in Jesus. It's saying if you truly have placed your faith and trust in what Jesus has done for you, you should be able to tell people about that hope that you have. And 1 Peter 3.15 says just that, But in your hearts regard Christ the Lord as holy, ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for this hope that is in you. If someone says, why are you different? Why, why aren't you worried during this cir difficult circumstance in your life? You say, well, I'm glad you asked. Let me tell you. And you can tell them your story of God's faithfulness and his transforming work in your own life. What a powerful and incredible testimony. And this is exactly what Paul does. We need to know our story well enough to share it in a way that presents the gospel and its effects on your life. Now, our story can't just be our story without the gospel. It needs to be the gospel given in our own context and how God has worked in our own lives. And we need to be ready to share that. I don't, it's probably good to have a, be able to think through it and share a version that's five minutes, if that's all you have. Maybe even 30 seconds, if that's all you have. But, but know it well enough to even be able to share if you have a longer time, even like Paul had at this moment. We should know our stories and use it as an effective tool to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, God's method to reach people is people, right? He could very easily think about it. Why didn't God just make it where he would work in someone's heart and they would believe? And take us out of it because we mess up a lot, right? But that's not how God did it. God chose to make the primary means of the gospel going to the ends of the earth us, his church, believers. That is our mission and our responsibility. That is why we are here. God uses people to reach people. We see this all through the book of Acts. You say, well, what about Paul? You know, Paul, he, God didn't use people to reach him. Jesus came in, in a vision, but even in Paul's story, Who's one of the central characters of Paul's story is Ananias, who, who, who calls him to act and to, to go, to, to call out to the Lord, to, to be baptized. Ananias was, was influential in even Paul's life. And, and we can see that again and again. The Ethiopian eunuch who was there on the road and Philip comes and shares the gospel. People can be searching. And you even hear stories today of, of people in, in other countries in the Middle East having these dreams and visions. But almost every story that I've heard of these dreams and visions drives these people to an actual person that can clarify and present the gospel to them. God does not want to reach people without using his people. And so we need to be ready and willing to do that. We must practice relational evangelism. What do I mean by that? It's just simply that. We build relationships. We build bridges for the purpose of introducing people to Jesus, the one who's changed our own lives. You see, many Christians are never going to stand in front of a, a group of people like I am or like Paul did. You say, I, I could never get up in front of a big group and, and, and share a gospel message. I, I, I'd get nervous. I wouldn't know what to say. Well, that's not what God calls us to do when he says, go, therefore, and make disciples. Maybe we can't do that, but we can be a bold witness for Christ. But the problem is, many Christians are making a lot of friends, but no disciples. Right? We're, we're good at the relational part. We can build bridges. We can find things in common. But then we never connect those pieces. We never use that as a bridge to share God's truth. I'm guilty of this. I, I like being around people. I like building relationships. I, I like finding something I have in common with someone and, and getting to know them. But listen, if I'm not using those opportunities to share God's truth, then I'm missing it. And it doesn't mean that you go out and every time you make a friend, you say, well, you need to repent, right? But, but we're usually, we don't struggle with that. 
we usually struggle with building relationships and then months pass and years pass and we say, well, I'm getting to know them a little bit more. I'm just waiting for the right opportunity and then we never share the gospel with them. We miss the opportunity. We're good at making friends, but we're not making disciples. That can't be true of our lives as Christians. You see, there's no way that someone could have gotten to know Paul well at all without hearing his transformational story. Is that true about us? Jesus was so central to who Paul was that the gospel couldn't help but spill out of him. You couldn't be friends with Paul and then all of a sudden after a year or so say, oh, I didn't know he was a Christian. I didn't know that he went to church. I'm sure you know pretty soon because his whole life was about his mission. It's a challenge to us. Is Jesus and the gospel so central to who we are that when we rub shoulders with people around us, they cannot help but see and hear us talk about him? Are we bold in proclaiming what God has done for us? You see, God wants to use you it's not just, oh, oh, my neighbor is uh, interested in, in Jesus and he asked some questions, so I want to bring him to church or have the pastor come talk to him, right? I would love to do that, but I don't need to. You can talk to him. God's placed you there. He's built that relationship so that you can share your story to share the gospel with that person. But we need to be intentional about doing that, relational evangelism. And finally, we need to be creative in using the tools that God has given to us. Be creative in using the tools God has given us. Let's finish this, picking up in verse 22, reading through verse 29. It says, they listened to him up to this point. So what point? Last thing he said was, he said to me, Go, because I will send you far away to the Gentiles. They didn't like to hear that. When they, they were following him up, up until this point, listening to everything he said, when he said that, they lost it. And literally, they lost it. They went nuts. They went crazy. Listen, they said they raised their voices shouting, Wipe this man off the face of the earth. He should not be allowed to live. As they were yelling and flinging aside their garments and throwing dust into the air. Can you imagine this scene? Just over this phrase that, that Paul was saying, God has called me to take this truth of the gospel to the Gentiles. They didn't want to hear it. They wanted him dead. It says, as they were doing this, the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks, directing that he be interrogated with a scourge to discover the reason they were shouting against him like this. He said, this is, look at this. There must, this guy must be bad because look how these people are responding to him said they're going to they're gonna whip him with this, this whip that had all these pieces of bones and metal on the end that would tear the flesh and saying, we're going to get him to tell us what he's really up to. And so they get ready to do this. It says, as they stretched him out for the lash, Paul said to the centurion standing by, is it legal for you to scourge a man who is a Roman citizen and is uncondemned? When the centurion heard this, he went and reported to the commander, saying, What are you going to do? For this man is a Roman citizen. The Roman commander came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, he said. The commander replied, I bought this citizenship for a large amount of money, but I was born a citizen, Paul said. So those who were about to examine him withdrew from him immediately. The commander, too, was alarmed when he realized Paul was a Roman citizen and he had bound him. So here, he's about to be beaten, and I, I love how it says, it's just very casual. He's like laid out there, and he turns around, and he just asks a question. You know, oh, remind me, is it legal for you to, to do this to a Roman citizen? And that starts all the whispers, and they run, and they, they, they tell, and, and basically, this, this commander said that he, it was possible to buy Roman citizenship during that time, but, but it took a lot of money to do. He said, I, I bought my citizenship. Is that what you did as well? And Paul says, no, I was born a Roman citizen. And, and so Paul uses this in order to, to prevent this, the, the, the lashes from happening. But it leads to the question, why did Paul wait until now to tell them this? 
Why did he wait until now? Well, we know that he wasn't afraid of persecution. He'd gone through that before. He'd been stoned. He was willing to lose his life, much less be beaten for the sake of the gospel. So why would he bring this up? He did it now because he knew it would give him a greater platform for the gospel. He used it at just the right moment because he knew that it would begin to, to push him towards where he needed to be, and that's Rome. And so this, he was using it strategically for the gospel. You see, God has given each of us a unique platform. The question is, are we using it? God has given you a unique platform. He's placed you right where he has placed you. In, in the surroundings that you are, the job that you're at, the people that you're with, he's placed you there for a purpose. He's given you a platform, and each one of us, that platform is different. But the question is, are we using it for the sake of the gospel? Paul had given, or God had given Paul a, a gift, Roman citizenship. He was born into it. And he knew that it would be influential in Paul's life to get him exactly where he needed to be and to be able to make an impact for the gospel. God's done the same thing in your life. You were born into the home that you were born into, the country you were born in. The, every step of your life is organized. God's given you a platform. How are you using it for the gospel? See, there are many creative ways that we can advance the gospel. We heard about one of those this morning, didn't we, with the story of Lottie Moon. You know, she realized there's this barrier between me and the people. How can I make a bridge in order to close that? Well, she baked cookies, right? It's something so simple. There's so many different things. Lottie Moon baked cookies. Maybe you enjoy sports. Sports is an incredible way that you can build bridges and a tool that you can use to build relationships and then focus on gospel witness. Maybe things like fishing. That was big in Palau. We, I loved fishing, but we, uh, one of the other missionaries had a boat. And so a lot of the people on the island loved to go out and fish, but many didn't have a boat. So if you said, hey, you want to come with us, it doesn't matter who they were or how much they liked you, they'd come because they wanted to get out on the, on the ocean and fish. And so then you would, they'd be stuck on a little boat with you for hours. All right? <laughs> the joke's on them. But using those things as tools to be able to build bridges for the gospel. We see Paul doing it, and we are called to do the same. You think about tools that God has given you. Even in being born in this country and having a passport, an American passport, can get you in many places in the world that other people cannot go. Have you asked God, do you want me to use this for your glory? To spread your name among the nations? Maybe it's the education that you've had the privilege of getting. Maybe that could open up doors that otherwise you could not have. And the list goes on and on and on. God has given you, each one of us, tools to be able to build these bridges, but for one purpose. To spread the good news of the gospel to those who do not know Jesus. One of the greatest barriers to sharing the gospel is a fear of not knowing how to begin, right? How to begin that conversation. We're afraid that people won't listen. Maybe they, they will think that we're a little bit weird, all right? Or, or we won't exactly know what to say. We look at great men like Paul and we think, well, Paul could do it, but I, I'm no Paul, right? We look at these missionaries, well, well they, they had some special filling of the Holy Spirit to be able to do things like this. I can never do that. Well, that's not true. You read their stories and their biographies. They're no different than us. Sinners saved by grace, empowered by the Holy Spirit, and are faithfully pursuing what God has called them to do in their lives. And we can do the same. We're commanded to do the same. They sought these missionaries to build bridges with the lost by being willing to let go of things that weren't important. That's one common thing you see with effective missionaries. They're willing to let go of things that are not important in order to focus on the gospel by using the platforms and tools that God has given them to develop these relationships with people around them and by boldly telling their story of how Jesus radically transformed their lives. We can do the same. We can do the same thing right where God has placed us. So as we close, we ask the question, so what? So what? What does this mean for us? As we go out from here, 
First of all, is there anything that you are holding on to that has become a barrier to the gospel witness in your life? Anything that has become more important than the gospel? Secondly, are you ready and willing to tell your own story? This takes work. I mean, you think, well, it's my story. Of course I know it, but I'm talking about knowing it well enough and how to, to verbalize it to other people. If you haven't, if you can't do that, I would encourage you, spend time working on that. Say, if someone, I have an opportunity to tell what God has done in my life, what would I say? Write it out. Jot some notes down. Be ready to tell it. Because that's God's work in your own heart, and it can change other people's lives as well when they hear it. Thirdly, what platform has God given you? And are you using it for gospel witness? What you Ask yourself, and this is going to be distinct to each person, what platform has God given you? And how can you use that to advance the gospel? And then finally, what tools could you use to develop intentional relationships for the gospel? You've heard of a few examples. A list could, could go on and on. What has God given you a, 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 a desire to do, a joy in doing, something that you, you like doing that you could use to build relationships that could lead to gospel conversations and you telling your story? All of us should be involved in this work together. It's not just one person, or it's not just like, well, when I get to be a Christian a little bit longer, or, or I grow in my relationship with God, then I'll do that. No, all of us are called to do that. From the moment that you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus, you have a story to tell, and we should be telling it. My prayer is that we are a church that recognizes God's call in our life, and that we are intent on sharing the good news of the gospel with those around us. Let's pray.